Herkese merhabalar. Welcome everyone. My name is Etam Can Turhan and I'm an assistant professor of environmental planning at the University of Groningen, Netherlands. It's a great pleasure for me to host this 10th meeting of a common horizon for humanity and the planet seminar series organized by Cappadocia University. This seminar series aims to bring together the leading thinkers uh, today to better understand today's world, to create an international intellectual platform that draws its strength from human dignity and that aims to build uh, new ideas, new notions for the future of humanity and the planet uh, from a holistic perspective. I particularly would like to thank Associate Professor Shafak Oz for his kind invitation and to all the organizers at the Social and Strategic Studies Center at Cappadocia University uh, for organizing this seminar series and also making uh, this event possible uh, with a very important guest, a very important speaker and a very important topic. So today we will talk about limits in the context of the contemporary environmental, economic and societal crises. And this requires us to rethink um, and remake, if possible, the key goals, objectives, and orientation of the socioeconomic and political organization of our societies. Over the past two months, we have witnessed the launch of two very important reports uh, by IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The first one on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability mentioned for the first time the term degrowth 15 times whereas the following one on mitigation of climate change released on 4th of April um, basically mentions this term uh, for the first time in the history of this largest peer-reviewed literature review uh, in the world. And just the next day on April 5th, uh, not exactly the most likely person to preach radicalism, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres uh, tweeted the following. He said, and I'm quoting here, climate activists are sometimes depicted as dangerous radicals, but the truly dangerous radicals are the countries that are increasing the production of fossil fuels. Investing in new fossil fuel infrastructure is moral and economic madness. End of quote. So that was the UN Secretary General. And we actually, in the past few years, uh, have heard similar comments uh, from figures stretching all the way from the Pope uh, to UN Secretary Generals, heads of states, and so on and so forth. And today you see some of the most unlikely people, uh, like lead economists at the World Bank, uh, engaging with these ideas of how to rethink the notion of growth and, and degrowth. You also see people from uh, different parts of the political spectrum, including but not limited to eco-socialists and others, somewhat scrutinizing this idea uh, around limits and, and growth. And in, in this context, um, some of the people who think about the notion of growth, degrowth, and limits, including our speaker, Professor Yorgos Kallis today, argue that democratically planned limits can open space for alternative and diverse conceptions of a better life a good life. So without further ado, today I have the great pleasure and joy of introducing a teacher, a mentor, a friend, and a colleague of mine. Uh, Yorgos and I met about 14 years ago, quite a while back, when I moved to Barcelona for my master's studies. And I had the pleasure of having him as the supervisor of my master thesis and later on uh, for my PhD thesis. Um, Professor Yorgos Kallis is an ICREA research professor at the Institute of Environmental Science and Technology, ICTA, at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. Yorgos received his undergraduate education in chemical and environmental engineering at the Imperial College, went on to pursue a PhD in environmental policy at the University of the Aegean. And much later, during a sabbatical, he also pursued a second master's in economics from the Barcelona Graduate School of Economics. Uh, after a relatively brief stint of work on water framework directive and issues around uh, this, he went to UC Berkeley as a Marie Curie International Fellow. And he eventually joined ICTA, uh, where we also met. Yorgos also held 
uh, previous different other positions, including Leverhulme visiting position at SOAS UK. And last but not least, he was also the project coordinator of the European Network for Political Ecology, which I would argue that has accelerated uh, the proliferation of a new generation of political ecology scholarship in Europe and beyond. Yorgos is the author, co-author, or editor of many books, including Degrowth, a vocabulary for a new era from 2014, also translated to Turkish as Küçülme Yeni Bir Çağ için Kavram Dağarcı, published last year from Metis, two years ago already, in 2020, from Metis. And his articles on Degrowth also appeared in an edited volume in Turkish, Yeşil Ekonomi Küçülmek Güzeldir. And other than these, Yorgos also published a number of books, one of which will be the basis of today's talk uh, that came out in 2019 from Stanford University Press, Limits, Why Maltus Was Wrong and Why Environmentalists Should Care. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to Yorgos for his lecture, and then we will have about around 40 minutes, uh, and then we will move on to questions and answers. So please do send your questions to us. Uh, over WhatsApp or YouTube comment button. And Yorgos, the floor is yours. Thank you, Entam. Thank you very much for the presentation. And um, my thanks also and gratitude to Professor Safak Ogus and for his invitation to present uh, in, uh, in your platform. Uh, and I've seen that you've hosted uh, some important speakers before me. So I hope I can raise to the occasion and meet your expectations. Uh, as Etam said, uh, I want to talk today about my work uh, on limits. It's a book I published in 2019 uh, at Stanford University Press. It's now being translated in different languages. Maybe I inspire uh, someone to translate it also in Turkish. I would be happy to have a translation also in Turkish. Uh, it's, a, it's a timely book in the sense that not only that the question of limits, as I will argue, is a central question uh, for our times and for our civilization. But I think it's also timely to talk about limits 50 years uh, after the publication of uh, the Club of Rome's report, uh, Limits to Growth. It was published in 1972. And according to many, it was the book that launched uh, the modern environmental thinking and the modern environmental movement uh, with its positive and negative points, as I will present uh, in my, as I will argue in my presentation. So 50 years or half a century after the publication of this milestone report, Limits to Growth, uh, half a century is a long period of time, is a time that we can reflect. But it's also a period that unfortunately we live within some of the dire predictions of this report um, regarding the impacts and the consequences of an ever expanding economy choking with the biosphere. Uh, and some of these impacts uh, are becoming increasingly evident uh, in terms of climate breakdown, climate change, and many other problems. Uh, but I'm, as I'm going to argue today, it is time also half a century has passed. So uh, fortunately, also our uh, way of thinking has evolved. And it's a time to sit back and reflect. And as I'll argue, rethink uh, this notion of limits, a notion that it's uh, central to environmentalism uh, and central to environmental thinking, which is my area of expertise and the area that I would like to invite you today to think alongside me. So let me start the presentation uh, by something a little bit funny, but not that funny in the sense that I want to... Uh, I'm starting the book and I want to start this presentation with a seeming paradox, which is that our civilization, and by our, uh, I mean the capitalist Western civilization, and even if Turkey is a little bit to the east, Greece is also a little bit to the east of Western Europe, you're a little bit more to the east, but this doesn't mean that anyone is outside of this um, prevalent Western capitalist civilization. Of course, it's of our cultures, maintains also different elements and different ways of thinking. But to one extent, uh, the Western capitalist civilization that appeared with the Industrial Revolution in England in the 18th century is the dominant civilization right now. And within this civilization, there is a very paradoxical uh, relationship with the idea of limits. 
on the one hand, limits are something that uh, in our culture, sorry, I will use this hour uh, without wanting to say that we are all Americans, but in one sense, we are all Americans to the extent that we watch Hollywood movies and are fed by this culture now. But uh, I very much recognize our differences as Greeks or Turks or as Asians or Africans or, or other things. So I'm, I'm going to use this hour or we um, in a schematic way, no? We to the extent that we tend to think in this way. So in our culture, our within quotation marks culture, overcoming limits is some sort of an obsession. Um, you know, I went to the gym the other day and uh, I took this picture. My students keep sending me pictures from these different places where there are all these kind of mottos and sayings like beyond limits. There are only limits in your head, you know, you can overcome them. Like try harder, work harder, and there are no limits. The only limits uh, are the sky. And this is what uh, the cover of my book played with, you know, like limits and then it's the sky. There is a saying in English which says the only limit, the, there is no limit. Uh, you can go even further, you know, like nothing can stop you. Uh, you might be among the people who use uh, self-help books and then you hide them under your bed because you're ashamed. But there is a whole literature, uh, American Anglo-Saxon literature, that it's about how to overcome your limits, how not to limit your own personal growth, uh, how not to be afraid of limits or be turned down by limits. Uh, this obsession with going beyond limits is also a cornerstone of economics and politics. As Ronald Reagan or... Some people would say he's speechwriter, as he wasn't that clever himself, but he was very good at delivering speeches. Uh, he said, there are no limits to growth because there are no limits to human intelligence, imagination, and wonder. Uh, to which another cultural icon at the time, this is Bruce Lee, uh, responded, yes, there are no limits. There are only plateaus and you must go beyond them. So this was a Kung Fu champion, but also talking about this, overcoming uh, of limits, which is so prevalent in our culture. Uh, jokes aside, and uh, I'm going to make a few jokes in the presentation. I like that. I make them also in the book, but uh, this is not a fun presentation. It's quite a <laughs> serious topic and important and a grave topic, the, the questions of limits to growth. Uh, our obsession with limits, and here's when it turns uh, less funny, uh, is matched only by a mirror obsession that there is in our civilization, that a fear of the ultimate limit of our collective death, uh, the end of this civilization. California's drought, the New York Times tell us, and this was back in 2018, pushes the state against the limits of nature. Uh, likewise, the IPCC, in its report, repeated reports keep hammering the same message civilization it's at stake if we don't act now and limit global warming the united nations warn us so on the one hand there is this obsession with overcoming limits and on the other hand there is this fear of the ultimate limits limitless growth and natural limits i will argue in my presentation are two sides of the same coin scarcity the idea that there is a limit with which we cannot overcome justifies progress. And progress produces scarcity. So this invocation of limits is what drives this constant drive uh, for limitless growth. To escape this disastrous path of limitless growth, I invite you to follow me in rethinking what limits are. What is it that we mean when we call for limits? This is the question that I'm sending in this presentation. Limits, I will argue, are not something that it is out there, an internal or external barrier that doesn't let us do things. Limits, I will propose, are a choice. We can choose to limit ourselves or we can choose not to and then live with the consequences. Limits, therefore, are not a constraint of freedom. Without limits, there is no real freedom because there is not anything. Let me explain what I mean, or might have sounded a little bit too theoretical, by starting with a fable, that it's a myth or a story. In the movie, The Legend of 1900, the film's protagonist, uh, 1900 is his name, was named for the year he was bo born. As a baby, he was found in a box on an ocean li liner. Played by Tim Roth, uh, the character, 1900, never leaves the ship where he was found. 
and he develops a gift for piano. Famous jazz pianists come to the ship to duel with him, who is the best piano player, and he beats them all. When a music producer asks him to record an album, 1900 decides to leave the ship. In a memorable scene, for those of you who have watched the movie, he's halfway down the ladder of the ship for the first time in his life. No, he was found a baby in there and he grew up all his life in there. He's halfway down the ladder and the crew is out on the top of the boat saluting him goodbye. 1900 stares in the city in front of him and then he balks. Turning around, he looks back to the top of the ladder and decides to remain forever aboard. Many years later, 1900 hides in the ship's hold. His friend Max begs him to leave. The ship will be exploded, scuttled and sunk on the bottom of the sea. And 1900 wants to stay inside the sea. 1900 refuses to leave. He wants to stay there and he responds to his friend. All the city, this is the city that he saw in front of him when he tried to exit the boat. All that city, you just couldn't see an end to it. It wasn't what I saw that stopped me, Max. It was what I didn't see. In all that sprawling city, there was everything except an end. The keys of a piano instead, they begin and the keys end. You know, there are just 88 of them. They are not infinite. You are infinite. On those keys, the music that you can make is infinite. But you get me up on that gangway and roll out a keyboard with millions of keys and there's no end to them. That keyboard is infinite. But if that keyboard is infinite, there is no music you can play. 1900, I would argue, limited himself because he wanted to. It wasn't the city or the, the, or the ship that limited him. It wasn't that he couldn't go out. It was that he wanted to stay out in order to be able to play his piano, to create his music. This is what I call self-limitation. This is a core concept that I develop in the book. This concept of self-limitation was first proposed by Cornelius Castoriadis, a Greek philosopher who lived most of his life uh, in France. Castoriadis has his own boat story. He left Greece in 1945 on board uh, the New Zealand Ocean Liner, Mataroa. Uh, the French Institute had chartered this ship to save uh, left Greek intellectuals during the, civil during the civil war. And Castoriadis was just a student at the time, but he was one of the important uh, thinkers of the left, uh, left movements uh, at the time in Greece during the civil war. In Paris, where he moved, Castoriadis directed the GDP unit of the OECD. So he took an important position as an economist. But using a pseudonym, he founded a revolutionary magazine and a group called Socialism or Barbarism. He taught also Greek later, uh, after the OECD, he taught Greek philosophy at the Sorbonne, uh, classical Greek philosophy, I mean, of course, while doubling also as a psychoanalyst. Here he looks in this photo more like uh, your psych a psychoanalyst. But he was a person who had this unique ability to bring together the classics, psychoanalysis, uh, economics, and put it in a clear di the direction of political thinking and uh, democracy, which was his main topic. Castoriadis made the conceptual distinction that I, it's important for my presentation today and my book. He distinguished between heteronomy and autonomy. Heteronomous societies, Castoriadis argued, attribute their laws, their nomos in, uh, in Greek language, he attributed them, they attribute them, these heteronomous societies, to an external force, a hetero, other. Typically, it is the gods. If you think of the Moses finding the Ten Commandments, this is a typical heteronomous uh, attribution of the law. So the law of society wasn't produced by the society, but came by the goats in the form of uh, Ten Commandments written in a, in a stone. Autonomous societies instead, Castoriadis argued, set their own limits and laws consciously and deliberately. In autonomous societies, the, G, the seed of which Castoriadis locates in the classical Athenian democracy, 
but also in the Enlightenment, uh, there are no truths that cannot be questioned. Laws, in other words, are up for debate and for change. In that sense, the autonomous society self limits itself. It's a society that decides uh, which are its own limits. And these limits are not given from the outside. They are not given from the gods or from nature or from some other force that it's uncontrollable uh, by the collective itself. So I talk a lot about Greece. I think you appreciate it as being uh, good neighbors. Um, I have a little bit of a personal touch in my book. So I talk a lot about Greece, not because I think we are any better civilization. I'm not that type of chauvinist, you know. Um, but because I want to root what I'm arguing uh, in terms of a line of thinking, of cultural thinking, uh, in which I am um, ingrained in and trained in. But as I will argue, we all are, uh, those of us who live in Turkey, those of us who live in the Netherlands or have grown up in other countries, we are all part of uh, long lines of cultural thinking that has a very different conception of limits than the one that it's promulgated in the capitalist civilization. Allow me here the chauvinistic digression a little bit to follow Castoriadis and see how a very different notion of limits was uh, prevalent in classical Greece. And I will argue after why is this uh, relevant if we think about uh, contemporary questions of limits such as global warming and environmental limits. The very founding of the Athenian democracy uh, was an act of setting limits by Solon uh, who was the arts legislator and limit setter. Uh, interestingly, Solon, who was the one who is supposed to be the founder of the Athenian democracy, who wrote down the laws of the democracy and tried to put a limit on inequality, basically, and on the accumulation of wealth by the rich, but also to, to establish a democratic system that put these limits. Interestingly, Solon limited himself too. So completing his legislative work and being the most important person in the city, he left Athens, self-exiled in his own words, to avoid becoming too powerful. So he also, to be consistent with what he advocated for the city, he left uh, the city so as not to accumulate too much power and wealth. No other ethic was more celebrated in a classical Greek society than the art of limiting oneself, the so-called phronesis or prudence in English. Unlike the moderns, for the Greeks desire was not to be liberated from all limits, but was to be crafted within limits, nothing in excess. Anticipating the insights of modern psychoanalysis, the challenge for the Greeks was how to how to sort out real from false desire, not how to realize whatever desire you might have. They had elaborated rituals that dealt with death, which is the ultimate limit, which in our civilization we try to avoid at all costs. And they had tragedy, the form of tragedy, to remind them of the consequences of crossing uh, uncrossable limits. In their philosophy also, the infinite was condemned while the limited was celebrated. Why was that? Why did this happen in classical Greeks, Greece? For Richard Seifert and his book about money in the Greek uh, culture, the Greek culture of limits was a reaction to the invention of money and its catastrophic potential to grow without limit. The Greeks were among the first to, to use money that extensively, no? and they realized uh, how much how lending uh, money at an interest rate can very quickly create a very unequal society where the majority holds the wealth and the sorry the minority holds the wealth and the minor, majority has to even enslave itself in order to pay its debts and that's what caused the civil conflict at the time in Greece in ancient Greece that Solon came to resolve uh, by establishing democracy and by putting limits on how much power uh, the powerful can can accumulate. The Enlightenment, Castoriadis reminds us, uh, revived this Greek spirit of democracy, of questioning truth, of setting limits democratically. But this choked with the spirit of capitalism, which was also emerging at the same time, and it's not to be quenched, pursuit of ever more money without limits. So capitalism was the exact opposite, it was the 
uh, sell the, the liberation of money from any limit, which was precisely what the classical Greeks were trying to limit, was this destructive power of, of money to accumulate without limit and for compound growth. No? For Castoriadis, today it is the environmentalists, uh, those, the only movement which keeps alive the original promise of the Enlightenment. They alone insist against all loads that we should limit ourselves. But do all environmentalists who involve uh, invoke limits live up to this standard? Environmentalism, I argue in my book, um, has a mixed take uh, on limits, uh, mixing both aspects of what Castoriadis would call autonomy and both of what he calls heteronomy. And I think uh, the second uh, part, the heteronomous part, is quite problematic. On the one hand, there is a line of thinking among radical environmentalism which uh, expresses a strong desire to put limits to compound growth, to endless economic growth. In this tradition, tradition that I share and I see, my part, I see myself as part of, we want to bring economic growth to an end, to a limit, because growth is catastrophic and is alienating. By limiting ourselves and living simply, we leave space to others, human and non-humans, to simply live. And like the pianist, 1900, by limiting ourselves, we construct meaningful lives and we can create uh, things. The idea of a simple life within limits can be traced back to radical green movements like the anarcho-feminists of Emma Goldman at the turn of the 20th century, who in turn <clears throat> were inspired from the romantics before them and from there uh, back to early Christians, Romans and Greeks in the Western tradition. <clears throat> but likely a same spirit of simplicity we can trace uh, with deep Eastern roots. We can find it in Buddhism and Taoism, in Islam or in Confucianism. So this line of thinking of uh, a good life like being a life within limits, a life where we limit ourselves because we love the other, we love our neighbor, we love the stranger, uh, is a teaching <clears throat> of many religious and spiritual uh, schools of thought. And it's the basis, one might argue, for civilization. <clears throat> On the other hand, in our environmentalist discourses, including mine, the desire for limits has often been mixed with a narrative of inevitability, of collapse of the finiteness of Earth, which poses ultimate limits. This is heteronomy. The planet here takes the place of the gods. It is Mother Nature that decides what the ultimate limit is, not we. And we can only obey this given limit. Unlike 1900, for whom the boat was a vessel of liberty, in ecologist Garrett Hardin's uh, lifeboat ethic, the Earth is a shipwreck. Our limited lifeboats are uh, full at their carrying capacity and we cannot take any more castaways. Uh, this was the metaphor, a very different metaphor of limits than the one I proposed at the beginning of my presentation that uh, a conservative ecologist like Garrett Hardin uh, proposed. Hardin was inspired by a very early economist, Thomas Robert Malthus, uh, who in 1798 concluded his essay on population, writing, there is not enough for everyone to have a decent share. Malthus's essay holds an iconic status in debates about limits. Understanding what Malthus said helps us see why Malthusians are wrong and why Malthusian environmentalism the environmentalism of the types of Garrett Hardin and others uh, is much closer to its supposed nemesis, limitless growth. So let me talk a little bit about Malthus. As the legend, uh, Thomas Robert Malthus, uh, his friends called him actually Bob, <laughs> was born in 1766. He studied at Cambridge and he went back home to Surrey where uh, he was a priest serving at the local parish and living with his parents until the age of 38, uh, 
uh, when he scored his best seller, the Asian population that made him rich and famous, and uh, married and uh, moved to his own house quite late. As the legend goes, uh, Malthus wrote the essay on one go after a fight he had with his father, Daniel. Uh, his father, Daniel, admired Rousseau and the French Revolution. Bob instead said to prove to his father, as he writes in the introduction to the book, where he said this book started after an argument with a friend. The friend was his father. He wanted to prove that his father to his father that he was gro uh, wrong and that he want, Malthus wanted to use the power of logic and mathematics that he had studied at Cambridge to prove uh, axiomatically that a classless society where everyone lives well uh, was impossible. So he wanted to argue against the French Revolution, to put it in simple terms, and the ideas, the egalitarian ideas of people like Rousseau. Malthus' essay is one of those classics that academics cite very often, but uh, I don't think they bother to read. So I read it and uh, I'm offering in my book and in my presentation here a quite different reading of Malthus from the one that it's taught at schools or the one that it's the dominant one. Established wisdom has it that Malthus uh, questioned progress and he predicted over population and famines. You will hear today that uh, Malthus was the first uh, this, uh, pessimistic environmentalist he predicted limits, he, he wasn't right, and the environmentalists today are also prophets of doom and they will be proven wrong uh, by a capitalist system that knows how to find solutions to problems when confronted to them. Now, the problem is that Malthus actually didn't argue that, and if we understand what Malthus argue, we will understand much better the relationship between capitalism and limits. Malthus actually in the essay, and this is something that it's not so much appreciated, uh, writes that there are no limits actually to resources or agriculture. So there are no limits to growth or environmental limits. Uh, raw materials are plenty, he wrote, and we can have as many commodities as we want. And for food, there are no limits either. Agricultural production, he wrote, can increase forever. Now, Malthus's uh, mentor at Cambridge uh, was William Paley, a famous theologist, for whom the greatness of a nation was counted by the numbers of the people. So the, the, the more population a country had, the more, uh, the more happy it was, but not also the more happy, the more it lived according to what God expected of the country, because God wanted us to populate the earth, so the more we were, the better. Malthus was coming exactly from that line, so he was never worried about overpopulation, as you will hear today, a term he never uses in the book. Instead, he wrote uh, that the country is happy when its population grows geometrically, without any limits. Malthus, in relation, uh, dismissed birth control, so it, he dismissed any limits on population. Not for moral reasons, but because, he wrote, limits to population would remove a necessary stimulus to industry. Malthus and Paley, one should remember, were clerics. They believed that God wants us to multiply. Assuming then a God-given nature to have as many children as possible, Malthus concluded that the world is and will always be scarce. As I said before, there will not be enough for everyone to have a decent share. Against scarcity, he argued, uh, the only thing we can do is work hard. Forget the uh, silly revolutions, was his argument, like the ones uh, espoused by the French, and produce more. European countries do well, he said, and have more people be precisely because of the industry of the people. Inequality in this context, uh, Malthus argued, is good because it forces the poor to work harder to become middle class and the middle class to work harder, scared that it will become poor. Uh, so for Malthus, the absolute good was growth. Given limits, the only thing we can do is try to grow. Protect people from getting poor, he said, and then they will have scores of children without limits and they, they, they not even uh, work to support them. So he built a first, he was the first person to build an argument in favor of limitless growth in the name of limits. Malthus's essay was as much the work of an economist as that of a cleric. Malthus held actually the first university chair in political economy. He was the first professional economist, one might say. Uh, 
Uh, and his economic theory was the first uh, built on the ad hoc assumption of a human nature bound to expand without limit. Uh, an assumption that it's cornerstone of modern economics in which one Malthus uh, positions on a... It's not a rational assumption, it's a theological assumption that Malthus positions on a particular reading, not the only possible reading, of uh, Christianity, which is a command from God uh, to grow and populate the earth. If uh, wants are unlimited, if our human wants, our nature is to have unlimited wants, as economists to this day assume they are, then the world is scarce by definition, a scarcity that can be confronted only by growth, economic growth. The assumption that humans want without limits is used to vindicate expansion without limit. Expansion, in turn, tautologically, is used as proof that humans do want everything without any limit. Growth promises everyone more tomorrow, but there will never be enough for everyone to have a decent share, as Malthus put it, even if the economy grows and grows and grows. This internal scarcity is the cornerstone of economics, as Lionel Robbins explained in the 1930s, a scarcity that knows no limit. Because no matter how much we produce, we will never have enough. Because what we want is infinite and knows no limit. Why care about all this today and why revoke Malthus after two centuries that he's dead? Why not leave the dead man in peace now? Because unfortunately, Malthus's framing of limits is still with us, courtesy of economics the religion, I would call it, of secular times. We by now have been trained to take it for granted that our wants and our desires are unlimited and are not to be limited, that the earth is scarce and is never sufficient to satisfy all our desires. Malthusian environmentalists in that sense may want to protect the earth, but they unintentionally play into the logic of growth that they think they are confronting. Growth is coming to an end, they are warning. Resources are running out. Oil is peaking. How can we sustain what we have a little bit more? Rebuting limits to growth back in 1973, economist Robert Solow saw this obvious contradiction of uh, Malthusian ecologists, and he joked that environmentalists are very pro-growth. They want to protect nature so that we have even more growth in the future. And I think this is precisely squared into the logic of Malthus, which was to invoke limits in order to justify limitless growth. Worst uh, at their extreme, Malthusian views of lifeboat ethics justify letting real people drown without lifeboats. Hardin once wrote that it is kinder to throw an atomic bomb to India than to help it with food. When Hitler uh, read Malthus's essay, he didn't think how to limit Germans, but how to expand and get space for the Aryan race uh, in Ukraine, speaking of that <laughs> right now, right? And Poland. So Malthus's, I would argue, idea is not a good idea put to a bad use. It is a terrible idea that was brought often to its terrible logical, to its terrible logical conclusion. The version of environmentalism and limits that I and others espouse, espouse defends instead the idea that our wants are not unlimited and that Malthus was wrong, not because he didn't see technology coming that he saw, but because he assumed that we cannot control our numbers. He didn't think we can apply birth control. He thought that left to our own devices, we will have as many children as possible. And if we don't, we will suffer, he thought, because our natural inclination, inscribed by God in our bodies and in our genes, is to have as many children as possible. And this was precisely his theological, tautological type of thinking, which was God wants us to have as many children as possible, therefore we should not limit ourselves. And if we don't limit ourselves, what does this mean? That we have to expand the economy as much as possible because we will never have enough for everyone. But Malthus, of course, was wrong in that. Already in his time, people were controlling how many children they had, as they have throughout human history. 
And as we know very well today, we can have fewer children and still enjoy love. We can consume less and live well. We can stay in the ship, to go back to my uh, starting metaphor, and play better piano. And actually, staying in the ship is the only way that in the long run we can play piano. No? As 1900 himself said, if we give us an infinite keyboard, after a while we won't play any piano. We are approaching the finale, I want to argue, of our planetary hubris. And our myths and stories are failing us. Hubris, for the classic, for the classic Greeks, was a transgression of previously undefined limits. Let me emphasize that. It was not a transgression of a limit that you knew it was there and you were going over it. You were transgressing a limit that you didn't know if it was there, it was uncertain, and you were transgressing it. The Greeks told stories of Icarus who flew too close to the sun and his wings melted. Of King Midas who turned everything he touched into gold and he died of hunger this way. They had also some more macabre, macabre and bloody stories, so like of King Erisichthon, who logged a sacred forest and he was condemned to eternal hunger, eating without limits, including at the end his own flesh. Instead, today, I would argue, we are celebrating hubris. Consider this movie, uh, Limitless, a 2011 science fiction film, starring Bradley Cooper. Cooper here plays a failed author who suffers from writer's block, so he cannot write, and he's abandoned by his girlfriend as a loser. Enter a new mind drug to save the day. In a few hours, Cooper starts taking this drug that he finds, and uh, he completes his novel, which becomes an instant success that leads to more success. The catch, though, is that uh, in order to get this drug and keep writing his novels and keep being now cool and successful, he needs more and more of this drug to keep up. And to find this drug, he has to have all sorts of <laughs> nasty fights and kill people to get his dose. Because without the drug, uh, it's not only that he won't be successful, he will collapse and die. So it's a drug that you either take or, uh, or collapse. Now, I hail from an older generation and I thought this was heading into some kind of uh, finale of hubris coming to meet the author, the, the, the protagonist and getting the lesson that, you know, once you get into this uh, snowball of drugs, etc., uh, at some point self-destruction comes. So I was, I was watching the movie, I was waiting for some kind of nemesis or a road to salvation. Uh, to the hero. But instead of dying or giving uh, the, up the drug, Cooper uh, manages to secure an unlimited supply. And then he learns also to weather the side effects of the drug and not to be threatened with dying. He gets his girlfriend back and he actually finishes the movie rising up to become a US senator and actually a prospective president of the United States of America. Hubris and morality and immorality are then glorified. The addict hero walks over corp corpses to get his dose and he cheats on his way to becoming the most powerful man in the country. Limitless, I would say, is a myth apt for a civilization obsessed with overcoming limits at all costs. It prefigured the macho pathology of a new breed of rulers who take pride in their lack of moderation and in the rescuing of all and every limits who want to extract coal and oil or log the Amazon for the sake of doing so. To be limitless is the dream of Elon Musk, who shoots a car up to space, aspiring to cross with his unlimited ego planetary boundaries. I don't mean to be a conspiracy theorist here, but from this photo, it seems like his car is going the wrong direction. It's coming back now. <laughs> Uh, to be limitless uh, is also the um, dream of uh, Musk's buddies from the Silicon Valley who want to build bunkers in New Zealand and store there their brains in clouds to escape the coming apocalypse. Facing self-limitation are political and technological leaders, or maybe call them elites. The only response they can think of is a hysteric rush to escape. 
to the moon or to their bunkers. The story I want to build instead is a story that has been with us since times immemorial. It's a story of limited life as the good life, of a limited life as the just life in solidarity with those in need. Paradoxically, I argue in my book, when we treat the earth as abundant, only then can we limit ourselves. And it is only when we limit ourselves that the earth appears to us as abundant. Uh, I trace this logic and this philosophy of thinking in indigenous civilizations. Um, but paradoxically, from our perspective, live in much more difficult situations like us, but they don't see the earth as scarce, they see it as abundant. And it is in this way that they limit also their interactions with the earth. I'm not the only messenger, of course, of this story. And as I said, there are many uh, religious and spiritual leaders, like Pope Francis, for example, who wrote a wonderful encyclical, embodying uh, this message of simplicity and limits with an oath of poverty leaving himself in a small apartment instead of the Vatican Palace. And it is not, of course, only the Pope or the spiritual readers. Think of all those who practice a sober life, sharing their time and resources in solidarity with others, in the church or in the mosque, in their community garden or in their cooperative. The urban dwellers who contend with their work, family or friends, do not seek power and ever higher salaries the peasants who produce enough to feed their families, and countless, countless others like the Greek grandmas uh, I portray here. Of course, you might be right to contest that the ability to limit oneself is itself a privilege. We live in a society that pushes us to pursue without limit, lest uh, we want to fall into a condition of limits not of our own choosing. The unemployed worker in the Rust Belt uh, or the mother of five in sub-Saharan Africa cannot choose to limit themselves. It is society, and might be more specific, it is capitalism that limits them. Self-limitation, therefore, is a privilege to fight for. Granted also, uh, limits are not always easy in practice. The thought of death and of our own ultimate limit is unbearable. It is easier to shred our internal limits and react than reflect on, reshape, and embrace them. Its new generation also wants to transgress the limits posed by its ancestors. Institutional or parental limits fuel the desire for trans transgression. And if you're parents, you know very well how difficult it is uh, to teach and have your children accept the notion of limits. No? It is also partly true that it is part of our of our humanity to want to overcome limits. I'm thinking here of my two twin daughters. They're just two years old and uh, last weekend for the Easter, we went, we live in the center of the city, a very cemented center of the city. So for the weekend, we went to the house of a friend who lives in the countryside and he has this big yard. He has their uh, swings, he has uh, toys, he has a uh, sandbox like everything that my children dream of when they go out of the house. And of course, when they arrived there, they loved it. They played for one day. And one, the next day, I I leave them out in the garden, a huge garden. And where do I find them? I find them in the entrance gate, trying to unlock the door and leave <laughs> the house and the yard and go out in the street. And that's where they stayed for the rest of our stay. Like I would tell them, come here to the swings, come here to play. They would always go to the gate and try to, to cross this limit. So, of course, there is something human there. But, of course, I think my children uh, will become even more human as they grow up and they learn um, They learn to play within their, their area. And they learn when it's time to cross and when it's time to stay, when it's time to take the iPad and when it's time to leave it to, to their mother. Uh, it is true that once the genie of limitless expansion in a capitalist civilization was left outside of the bottle, a civilization that I would uh, claim uh, liberated or our uh, child, child, childish and civilized instincts, personalized, I think, in a personality like Donald Trump. You know, it's like a personality that wants everything as a child, you know, and cannot take any no. Um, 
once this civilization has left this genie out, it's not so easy to put it back in. Because those who know no limits in our societies are the ones who accumulate power and who dominate. And they can use the means of violence, if uh, need be, to sustain their power. And those who live within limits are condemned um, to be in a situation of less power. The enforcement of limits also becomes a locus around which rulers amass power, invoking limits so as to keep the rulers the ruled in check. Yes, all these uh, reactions and uh, concerns about limits are correct, but I would argue it's necessary to insist and find new ways of establishing collective and fair limits while dismantling unjust ones. That is not easy, but against those pessimists who think there is no alternative because alternatives scare them, I remain optimistic that yes, we can limit ourselves faced with the consequence the dire consequences of not doing so. Malthus, uh, I argue, was wrong. Our wants are not unlimited, and unlimited wants are not in our nature. Our ability to reason and to reflect and to respond to what it is that we desire is essential to our humanity. We liberate actually ourselves, not by pursuing without limit our desires, by controlling, but by controlling those instincts that would enslave us or threaten to destroy us. Like women and men who mature in life when coming to terms with their own limits and with their own end, they find their true desires, civilization will have truly progressed when collectively we come to know and respect our own limits. Now, more than ever, I would argue, to progress may mean to stop to think and to act differently. Let us use our human intelligence, our imagination and our wonder in order to find our limits rather than burying our brains into bunkers. Thank you very much for your attention and the opportunity to share uh, my, my thoughts and my book with you. Thank you very much, Yorgos. This was just an excellent um, introduction to your book and I'm sure um, those among the audience who are already kind of picking up on these really interesting ideas will surely go to your book and I too will echo your comments that a Turkish translation should be uh, in the pipeline um, so that would be a very good addition to the growing literature uh, in, in Turkish as well. Um, and before we start with the Q&A, um, I would like to kind of point out something that you very nicely mentioned about the, the issue about humans coming to terms with their mortality as well. I mean, I guess that's also a very common uh, kind of theme, a recurrent theme, uh, not only in cultural production, which is, I mean, we see many... Uh, movies and, and novels and so on and so forth, basically facing our mortality, that is the ultimate limit of life, and then trying to transgress that uh, by, by different means, uh, usually in terms of techno fixes or basically metaphysical fixes, so to say. Um, this is kind of a, a very long uh, tradition of, of human thinking, so to say. But then again, uh, there are limits of this kind of thinking as well. And there are limits of our, of our biological life uh, and, and mortality. So basically coming to terms with this mortality beyond the body, be in, in the planetary body, uh, could be even more challenging, uh, mm -hmm. I suppose. Mm -hmm. So what I would like to do now is to uh, kickstart kind of a conversation with a few questions. And uh, the first thing that comes to mind um, is basically this connection that you kind of made at the beginning, well, starting from limits, limits to growth, 1972, um, all the way to the more recent framing of these limits, planetary boundaries. Obviously, there are connections in epistemological, political, and, and scientific terms. Uh, but then again, the idea of positioning uh, 
uh, abundance in the face of scarcity is, is a whole different thing uh, compared to this type of planetary boundaries and that kind of uh, framing, right? Um, so in this recent piece in, in Geoforum on, uh, on, again, limits, you argue that, and I'm quoting you, seeing the world as an external force that imposes limits on us is an integral part of capitalism's ideology of scarcity and, and, and growth. And basically, economists uh, and politicians, I suppose, also um, diverted most of these discussions on limits um, to producing technological and market fixes against scarcity and thereby and trying to remove hard and soft limits, um, so to say. So this is kind of a clear critique of more structural approaches. But then again, we also have critical thinkers like Matt Huber. And I know that you are in conversation with, with Matt Huber quite often on, on Twitter. Uh, from the trenches of socialist climate politics, suggesting that we will not win on a program of less limits and reductions. Mm -hmm. So in a time when we hear more and more about post-neoliberalism, return of the state, uh, state capitalism coming back very powerfully after um, COVID and so on and so forth, together uh, with the rise of China and so on and so forth. So how do you think we should think about the question of ideology vis-a-vis -vis limits, or how can we position, say, abundance in self-limitation ideologically? Yeah, I think the the ideology of uh, promising more as a way of better life is, is very much ingrained, as I said, uh, in the West and by extension, by the prevalence, um, by the ide ideological, to an extent, uh, predominance of the West and of the capitalist model in the world, it has been exported everywhere now. So this idea of um, of more as, as being the good life is very hard ingrained in everyone. So someone who starts from very pragmatic political consideration would say, yes, unless you you promise to people more, your political message uh, is not going to be majoritarian. That's that's that, I mean, that's an obvious thing, and that's something that one cannot deny on the one hand, but I think it's also very simplistic to take it at face value. Um, what do I mean by that? Uh, I mean, bo both left-wing or right-wing or socialist or non-socialist or populist movements promise more. The thing is that right now, uh, for the majority of people living in Europe, in Turkey, uh, with the exception perhaps of people living in China or some other parts like that, um, our lived experience is that uh, there isn't, there hasn't, more hasn't been delivered, let's say, the last 20 or 30 years. So uh, very few people live better than the generation of their parents. I mean, depending on which country you are, this can be uh, more or less true. In my case, in Greece, my generation of my parents lived had much more, let's say, and to an extent lived better than the generation of my grandparents. But me, I definitely do not have more or I don't live uh, better in material terms than uh, the generation of, of my parents. And I definitely live worse in many other ways in terms of uh, the quality of life that they enjoyed, the quality of the environment they enjoyed, uh, the future that they had in front of them for their children in terms of the, of the habitat my children are going to live in a climate breakdown. So uh, this story of more and more uh, is no longer uh, realized. Now, of course, myths can be mobilizing politically. So I understand that someone might argue our political movement, socialist or call it whatever else, um, can keep promising more. The question someone has to face is like when you can't deliver more, and when delivering more, uh, you can deliver maybe more for your country at the expense of others by using guns or arms or by shifting the cost of climate change uh, to the future and to others. Uh, when this is not possible, what do you have to, to counter propose there? And my argument is that there is another powerful story and it's a powerful story that has been there before capitalism and has stayed there always. And it's a powerful force of civilization, West and East, North and South, 
uh, of different spiritual traditions. And uh, my colleague from uh, Madrid, Jorge Richman, who had the privilege to have here at uh, our university to present the other day, called it as a very, he gave it a very simple term. It's not self-limitation, but it's like the principle of love the other, to love the other. In Christian uh, religion, it's love your neighbor. Uh, in ancient Greece, we would call it philoxenia, love, love of xenos, love of the stranger, of the foreigner, you know. Uh, this doesn't mean that the Greeks loved the foreigners. No, they were killing Persians and Persians were killing them <laughs> like crazy. So this, this never stops. But if it was just that, the killing, and that was the instinct liberated, uh, we would soon face an end. And in our current moment, uh, we're very likely to face the end of a nuclear uh, war if 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 uh, the instinct of loving the stranger of loving the foreigner of uh, loving the other the other with a capital o and limiting ourselves because if you love the other you have to leave space for the other you cannot pursue whatever you want to do because then the other stops existing uh, loving the other is the force of civilization and it's what has let us uh, inhabit this planet as, as human beings and uh, and involve and thrive to the extent we have thrived. Um, so I would say there has always been space for that idea. And it cannot be a, a coincidence that the bigger, uh, biggest political, if you want to call them also, and spiritual movements in the world have used this as their principle. They haven't used as their principle uh, the promise uh, of more. You're going to live better and you're going to have more money if you believe in our God. I was the, the God was a preaching of, of morality that people understood made sense. And uh, and I think, I don't, want, I, don't, I don't want to sound too religious because I'm not, <laughs> I'm not religious myself, but I think there is some value in, uh, in recovering uh, the culture of, of loving the other. And it's not, of course, just the culture of having the institutions and having the power um, to impose the will to love the other over those who would just want to love themselves without limit. Yeah, I guess kind of that is a very nice way to put it, to the, the idea of loving one another um, somewhat leads to the, the notion of caring for one another as well, I suppose. That's, mm -hmm. that's also the thing. And care is definitely one of the things that came out to the surface very clearly, uh, the importance of care, care work, care infrastructures. With the past two, three years with COVID uh, around the world, I guess that was also very clear uh, because, again, this is a moment in time which we are kind of witnessing so many overlapping and simultaneous crises kind of, kind of going through um this human societies in a in a really uh somewhat destructive fashion and mm -hmm. here um this whole experience with covid and also the the recent uh, russian invasion of ukraine and the whole kind of um fears around energy supplies and how to shift also brought the ideas of rationing um uh, as one of the ways forward so there are ideas of how do we ration energy how do we ration uh, certain goods and services and uh, this could start from the very simple limitation that if you would like to have um, cheaper gas bills you basically need to turn down your thermostat a couple of degrees so you don't rely on the russian gas mm -hmm. um, but then again this is more of a structural issue um, and i guess it's also good to kind of remind uh, this open letter uh, which you were also one of the signatories that came out during this COVID period the new roots for the economy and really kind of positioning life at the center of economic systems mm -hmm. uh, obviously this is kind of crucial to have um, a different look but at the on, on the other hand critiques would say that well particularly you know, when we have all these uh, millions of people living in energy poverty and so on and so forth how do we enact those limits how do we enact uh, the, the idea of 
for instance, rationing and so on and so forth. Um, so how could we kind of consider this experience that we had uh, in the past few years, particularly with COVID and now these all these debates in terms of can we put limits on uh, on these um, in a democratically planned fashion, not really top down imposed, but in a democratically planned fashion, uh, both on consumption, production and and all in that in between. Yeah, the COVID period was a was an example of how encountering a limitation that came from the ecological world, which was a disease, a disease caused by our encroaching in the in the other, in the world of of ecosystems, and in this way, cascading effects coming back to hit us, and limit in a way what we could do if we didn't want to face the consequences of dying or of our health systems collapsing. Um, and in that sense, the only reasonable response was to find ways to, in a socially agreed and sustainable way, to limit what, what we were doing, like not do things that we were doing before, right? That, that was the main challenge of COVID. And we saw that the, if we want to, to say which societies best manage that we would have to go towards southeast asia not china where we see now that you know it was the too too heavy-handed approach you know that it also faces its limits right now its problems but also not to, to the other extreme that you could go i don't know to texas or florida which was like just ignore that this is a problem maybe it isn't you know and go out and whoever survives survives you know and the rest die so in between, there was a European experience, which was a little bit um, I would say chaotic, uh, improvised, something's good, something's not, without without public consultation, without consensus, but with also some indirect implicit consensus by the population to the extent that people understood. That these limits, collective limits, were necessary in order to pass through a very difficult period, right? And then I would say the best examples one would find in countries like uh, Vietnam or um, uh, South Korea, um, countries that managed to find this balance between democratically, uh, effectively, with a strong state that represents the majority of people, collective limits that the people accept. And, and reproduce and that let the society uh, without having to go to the extremes of China no? um, let the society avoid the devastation that uh, other other societies experienced most other societies experienced and that was a small small pandemic let's say compared to what a big pandemic could be but even there we saw how difficult it was for our societies to think that okay we might not be able to fly for a few months we might not be able to do this and that so I think the pandemic in that sense serves as a, as a, you might call it not laboratory, but as a, as a real world experience and experiment of, of the kind of challenges we're going to confront much more intensely with climate breakdown and unfortunately on a much more misaligned time horizon in the sense that by the time we realize that we have to drastically limit our our fossil fuel based ways of living um, the effect we're gonna have on the climate it's gonna be less so there's not gonna be a one-to-one -one correspondence uh, but it is within this tinkering and improvisation between uh, state uh, driven and uh, society accepted based on a culture and based on a solidarity um, type of self-limitation that I see a, an avenue or a path towards confronting climate breakdown, difficult as it is. And I actually had this question from 
my my friend Jamie Skanderaiden uh, from Boazici University to ask you about the the connection between the framing of limits more as a theoretical uh, notion and uh, implementation uh, through some frameworks like Kate Rewards Donut Economics and how to really kind of bring this down. Uh, but that also brought me to this uh, recent interview with Vaclav Smel, who suggested that the most important thing to understand is, is the scale, uh, since scale also shapes uh, the way we understand limits and how to put limit, where to put limits, and how to implement and enforce uh, limits. Um, and obviously, there are different uh, examples of this, uh, like you mentioned in during the COVID period, well, we had to restrict uh, travel, we had to restrict certain issues. But then again, there are more democratic initiatives such as car-free cities, zero waste initiatives, city level donut economics, like uh, the one that Amsterdam municipality is now trying to, to enact. Um, so the question here is, at which scale do you think the limits would, would work best? I mean, we spoke a lot about the personal uh, level, uh, obviously, but is there a best scale at which those self-imposed limits could work? Is it the individual, the community, uh, the group, nation? Or do you think that there is uh, some virtue in thinking about the scales at which limits could work best? Uh, I don't think there is a scale that they work best, but there is uh, interrelations that uh, that are necessary in order to work as good as possible. So in our book, The Case for Degrowth, which is a follow up to the book on the limits, we argue for a, a interdependent change between the personal, the communal and the political and the institutional, if you want to call it this way. So. Mm, you need people with a culture of modesty and self-limitation. If you have like a million of small trumps, you, you're not going to go very far, you know. But if you have a culture of people who, who embody and live day in, day out, this ethic and this spirit of, of living, then you have a cultural base, let's say. Within the cultural base, there is space for economic practices that they are different and they they represent this spirit of limit to emerge. What is called the economy of the commons, for example, many different projects that they, uh, they embody the idea of the commons. Now, if you have that and you don't have political representation and political power, again, you're not going to go very far because a lot of uh, decisions are taken at the institutional level and uh, you know, to the extent that you don't talk with the main processes, you're fine. But then once you start talking, you're going to be repressed. So you need this uh, cultural and economic substrata to be expressed in a political movement that can then shift the institutions in a way that it's favorable to the overall coevolution of this personal ethic and this uh, collective practices. So in that sense, I see, I see it's chicken and egg, as they say, but here it's chicken and two eggs, two chickens, two eggs, you know, I mean, many things that one brings the other and one has to uh, to feed into the other. So I, I wouldn't underestimate any level of action. I mean, the, the international and level of action is obviously very important because even if a particular society or culture or nation decides to radically limit its carbon emissions, which is really difficult to happen within an interdependent globalized economy. But even in this hypothetical extreme case scenario, as long as you have other countries that they don't give a damn and they keep extracting fossil fuels and uh, emitting carbon dioxide, again, it's limited how far you can go. So then you need a collective self-limitation where the collective becomes the global. So it's a, it's a nested... Um, it's a nested problem that this limitation has to apply at different scales and where uh, without the dominant logic of limit in one scale, then the other scale is standing in a vacuum and cannot go very far. And the, the idea of, of limits is probably also very best kind of exemplified in this, like you mentioned, in the, in the case of carbon budgets 
and the whole framing of uh, climate crisis in the form of carbon budgets, because carbon budgets, in essence, um, suggest that, well, this is the limit maximum we can emit if we would like to keep uh, global warming below uh, 2 or 1.2 uh, Celsius degrees and so on and so forth. And then basically whatever remains becomes a political contestation between different actors. Okay, how do we distribute if there is this carbon budget, if there is this limit, then basically means it means that, okay, we need to decide who gets what, and it becomes an allocation problem. Uh, but then, as we also know, um, a lot of allocation problems are also, again, um, subject to different types of contestations. And in the book, um, at one point, you mentioned that um, you refer to this violence perpetuated in the name of limits and power relations hidden behind seeming, seemingly innocent claims about nature and its limits. So. I was wondering maybe uh, as a one of the last points before we wrap this up, can you maybe open up this idea of violence in the name of limits and and how do you see that? Yeah, there, there were two points in your in your question. Um, I mean, the first is about carbon budget. So carbon budget is something that to link it to my to my argument, it's something that appears as heteronomous. I mean, it appears something that's given by the nature of things, but of course, it is it is autonomous in the sense that it is us that we decide what's the budget that we want to use. There is nothing in nature that lets us lose use more carbon and have like worst consequences, right? Um, what I find problematic with the carbon budget, for example, is precisely because this um, this heteronomous twist takes place, which is like, you know, there are 400 gigatons that we can emit up to there. And this is coming from outside, from the scientists. It's not something that we decide that we want to reach. It's something that it's coming from the outside. It is, again, that within the capitalist system is like, yeah, we can overcome it. We can then have negative emissions and absorb carbon, or we can develop technologies for geoengineering. Or So this limit, again, becomes like a challenge of how, how do you respond to that. Uh, while I think the emphasis on climate change from the very beginning should have been, who cares how much is the budget? We have to, to zero emissions, right? The, 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 the thing right now is that there has to be like a fossil fuel non-proliferation really, like not, not use anymore for fossil fuels and have like a very clear agreement of what I would call self-limitation, which is how much fossil fuels and by when, all the way down to zero. Um, the budget kind of, I mean, I understand that there is some use in the information, useful scientific information, but you can see how mentally it uh, distorts the picture because it makes it again like, okay, it's a limited space. Can we stay within it? Can we overcome it and still be fine? Uh, what would happen if we go to three degrees? Again, it externalizes the question as something external, a limit to which we can relate and perhaps overcome or push in the future or fix with a technology, etc. And said so the self-limitation would be, you know, zero emissions by 2020. <laughs> How do we arrive there? No, uh, this this should this should have been the approach. Of course, it's not because we didn't think in this way that it didn't happen. It's because of power dynamics and how much the current economy and civilization is built around fossil fuels. Uh, to your second question about the violence of limits. Yes, I mean, this is the whole field of political ecology that uh, you and me are trained in. Um, it's quite a lot of work there. There is a lot of work on how claims about overpopulation and uh, uh, the need to limit population, for example, that they have been hand and glove with ra racist and xenophobic politics against immigrants, against um, uh, brown-skinned people, that they are the ones who should limit how many kids they have, while we we are fine, we're doing fine, you know, but they are having too many children, etc. So there is a particular use of discourse of limits, which is the one that I attributed to the fi figure of Garrett Hardin, but Garrett Hardin is just someone who in the ecological movement exemplifies these ideas, but he's not uh, the only one. And it's unfortunately quite dominant ideas. 
that they they, they, they bring with them um, linguistic violence, if you want to say it this way, in the sense of who they are, they assume as being the problem that has to be limited, which then, given the current uh, constellation of powers, translates also into actual violence, which is the violence of sterilizing people in Africa, which is what happened in the 80s in the name of such overpopulation, limits to population arguments. Um, so within political ecology, we are quite adept, uh, we have gone quite in depth with uh, demonstrating the potentially dangerous turns uh, discourses of limits can take. But what I try to do in my book is to recuperate a positive and egalitarian vision of limits that doesn't easily succumb to this um, um, reactionist uses of uh, discourses of limits that are used to justify limiting the other. So I want a theory of limits that loves the other, doesn't limit the other. And I guess that also um, means we all need to come to terms with our own contradictions as well in kind of thinking about both uh, self-limitation as you discussed and also caring for one another again in this interview with Vaclav Smil that I've earlier mentioned he at some point he suggests that well we have the same people who buy solar panels and heat pumps in their houses and then uh, also buy an SUV um, the same people stop eating meat they limit themselves but then fly over to to Tuscany for holidays uh, so basically, he ends up saying that we are messy, hard to define individuals. And I think that is probably also the case uh, for our societal organization. Messy, hard to define, uh, hard to change, but nonetheless possible to change. And I guess limits is uh, but one way to think about how to change the society, uh, the humans and non-humans in a unity uh, for better. Um, so before we finalize this this really nice lecture, um, do you have any final remarks, Yorgos? Yeah, to what you just said, I have a funny saying that a Spanish colleague said here, which says, if you have less than two contradictions or three, you're a fanatic. If you have more than eight, then you're like a hypocrite. So yes, something between three and eight. Uh, it should be fine. Yeah, and as we know from David Harvey, capitalism has 13 of those contradictions, so that it's should be many. beyond madness, <laughs> I suppose. It's too many. It's too many. Well, thank you very much, Yorgos. This was thank a you, lovely Adam. lecture and a great discussion, and uh, so happy to to be able to talk to you again. Um, this this has been a great opportunity, thanks to the people in, in Cappadocia University. Uh, Shafa goes and all his team. Uh, so I guess we're going to uh, wrap this up today. Thank you to everyone who's uh, tuned in and, and watched us. And have a great day. And then see you soon within limits, I hope. Thank you, Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye.